Hi everyone. Today I'd like to talk to you about the writing skills necessary for documentary film production. So far what we've been talking about is the kind of quick stories that a journalist might do for a television or a newspaper station where they go out and essentially cover a spot news story or maybe even a feature story that's got a shorter time frame and a more condensed story narrative uh, that the reporter is able to develop on the fly. For most film projects related to documentary, they, they occur in multiple stages. And here's a list of stages that we go through. Starting with a great story idea, we move into the real work, which is the pre-production planning. Uh, and then finally we go into production, and then we go into post-production. I think it's important to highlight that uh, most larger film projects require some form of funding and that there are generally two places in the process where the funding is actually released to the filmmaker. The first is in pre-production where you develop a proposal and a pitch and you s receive funding for either developing a script or uh, for doing the production. And the second point is after the production when you're into editing your project uh, generally, the funds aren't released until either a, a, at a minimum a rough cut has been made or ultimately after the final film has been submitted for approval. So this is a really important uh, presentation today about the business side of being a filmmaker in terms of how do you get funding, how do you get support for what you're doing. I want to point out the difference between a documentary film versus a feature film. With a feature film, you will typically have a story pitch, a proposal, and go straight into script production. However, with documentary films, oftentimes the script's not used because you can't predict what will happen when the camera is actually rolling. And so, in place of a script, we use film treatments and written proposals or even outlines to describe and help plan out that documentary project. So that's really what we're talking about, is how to do that pre-production planning necessary for producing a really strong documentary film. We're gonna go through uh, a simple film treatment, and then we're going to extend that out into a written proposal to take you through all the steps of how this can really help you with your film production. So what is a film treatment? Well, it's a document that gives an overview of your project with sufficient detail to allow a client or a funding source to understand your story and your visual approach to telling that story. A film treatment is not only used for creating film festival films, it's also used in commercial uh, work as well, where you're being paid by a client to tell their story. They want to know what they're receiving before they release any money for production. So a film treatment is this really important first step towards getting any project off the ground and getting paid to do it. It's also thought of as a very detailed story pitch. And in fact, what we'll see is if you develop your treatment out of that, you'll develop your uh, very quick story pitch at the end. A treatment differs from an outline because it shows you how you will film your story rather than just telling us the story. A treatment is a document that can become kind of the uh, guiding principles for your film production, making sure you have continuity in the look, feel, and the story arc of your documentary. So this is a really important first step to developing a strong uh, film. I want to caution you though that a treatment is not a shot list. Don't make the mistake of describing crane shots or dolly shots for a particular scene. It's about keeping the focus on the story and how it's going to move forward. Um, if you get approval to move forward on a project, you can go further in depth and develop what's known as a shooting treatment that contains more of those production notes that your production team will actually use to stay on task. Uh, but really, a treatment um, is about the story and what's compelling about that story. And so from that standpoint, the very first step towards making a effective film treatment is to start with research about your story. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of treatments and one in which I've actually written myself and here are the basic contents of any film treatment. And I want to tell you there's no standard uh, to film treatments. People do them a wide variety of ways, but it's really about telling your story in a compelling way so somebody understands 
what that film's going to look like before they ever see it or pay for it. So here are the basic contents that I've found uh, that are recurring in most film treatments. First of all is an overview, a log line, scope of the film, length, distribution, and media, outline, production elements, and the characters and storyline. I'm going to go through each of those right now. The overview is a brief explanation about what the topic of your film is, and it's also a presentation of your hypothesis. In order for this to be a compelling documentary, we have to be trying to ask a question and see what kind of response we might get from that. So uh, the overview is really where you describe what is the topic of our film and why do you think it's relevant and important to our audience. The log line is the actual story that you're going to be telling condensed down into one or two sentences. This is really the way we hook our viewer or the way we hook the, the client or the funding source to hold their attention. Otherwise, the project will end right there. So a log line is just your story condensed down into almost like an elevator pitch. The scope of film is really an important element because it's a list of what issues you're examining within your film. And it's really important because we need to limit the scope of the film and not try to say everything there is to say on a topic in a single film. It's where we really hone in the focus of what this film is about. We want to describe the technical attributes of what equipment are we going to use to record and edit the film. We're going to talk about the length of the film, which might affect where our distribution will be, whether it needs to be in movie theaters, on the internet, uh, or television broadcast. We want to start thinking about what is your intended audience and where do you plan to share this work. This is very important if you're trying to get investment into a film project because they're going to want to know whether or not you're going to have both the reach and even the possibility to commoditize it to realize some return on that investment. The outline is a sketch of your film that describes the narrative arc of your story. Generally we see a three-act story outline. The first act introduces the characters and the conflict of the story. The second act shows how the character faces the challenge. And then the third act shows the resolution, and we'll take a look at some examples of that. The next element of a film treatment is a list of the production elements. And this is a description of what the film will look like, how you're going to approach telling the story, what genre. Um, is it going to be cinema verite? Is it going to be an expository? Is it going to be a participatory documentary where you're actually one of the characters in it? Uh, what are those production elements that you need? What's the mood, the look to your production? Um, and it's also where you list all the resources you will need, such as any archive footage, music, locations, interviews, event coverage, uh, and what is your timeline for production. The last element of a film treatment are the characters and storyline. And this is where you list all the characters that will be in your story and what is their role in relation to the narrative arc of the, the log line, in terms of who are the characters that are going to help drive your story forward and what is their role within that story. So this is where you make sure you're keeping your story within the scope of work by eliminating any unnecessary characters that will distract or pull attention away from your uh, main story arc. Speaking of story, I'd like to talk for just a moment about our goal with storytelling is to create a sticky story. And what we mean by a sticky story is where you take all the knowledge that you have about your subject, about the, the people in your film, about the everything you know, and you just transform it into the most basic, simple story that's easy to remember. That the problem we have is when you're really invested in a story and you become an expert, you try to shove everything possible into your documentary film project. With a sticky story, we are really wanting to focus on what is the minimum amount people need to know to be able to remember that story. And so you have to keep your story simple, and you have to find the core of the idea behind that story, uh, and you have to find out what is the message you want your audience to take away from that story. So 
here are some uh, steps that I've found for you uh, from a great resource. Uh, there's a documentary film organization called From the Heart Productions that actually funds documentary film projects. And this is uh, their list of items for making a sticky story that you'll find over and over. First thing is, is to find the core story. What is, what is the essence of it? And prioritize that as being the most important aspect of your film production. The second aspect is what what is something that is unexpected uh, that you can reveal to your audience that will kind of get their attention, make them ask questions, and want to hang in there to find out the answer. The uh, next idea is to provide some concrete examples, uh, some concrete ideas that are easy to understand. And this is where you might think about how your visuals of showing instead of telling come into play. As photographers, we have to be able to really make things memorable by uh, showing rather than telling our audience what to remember. And then we need to add some credibility to our story. And, and this is where you bring in experts to uh, substantiate why what you're saying is valid. So we want to bring in some expert content into our story. And then finally, we want to tug at the heartstrings. And here you see Carol Dean saying that if you touch my heart, I'll reach for my pocketbook. And so um, at, this is where it gets at what's really important to understand about storytelling is that knowledge and facts does not change behavior, actions, moods, feelings, etc. It's about emotions that drive people to act. An example of this is how people can know that smoking will kill them but they will continue to smoke. The knowledge of the facts of the medical crisis are not very compelling, but when you see a documentary that talks about and shows the effects of lung cancer, that shows the effects of loss on families, and if you can show that graphically, uh, people's attitudes change towards a particular subject matter. So uh, be thinking about where is that emotional heart string being pulled in your story. Now what I'd like to do is actually look at an example of a film treatment that I've written uh, that I've recently updated actually. The first original treatment was done in 2011, uh, but sometimes over time you see new elements that you want to go back and rework a film, and this is one I definitely want to go back to. This is actually a film treatment I originally wrote for a film that was shown in Spokane International Film Festival. It was actually selected from a juried uh, panel to be presented at that festival and I've recently updated it because I'm going to go back and rework this film but it has all the elements of a film treatment that I'd like to show you for uh, conclusion to this particular lecture. First thing I want to point out with a, any film treatment is to not try to make it overly sophisticated in terms of graphic quality. People just want you to present something honestly and straightforward uh, and so we just have a title of the project sitting between two chairs and a simple statement that this is my film treatment. The next page is a table of contents and you'll see the different elements of the treatment listed here, the overview, log line, scope of film, etc. So here we have the basic overview of the film that is setting up the scenario where we're going back to the Cold War era uh, with a famous speech by Ronald Reagan where he asked Mr. Gorbachev to tear down this wall and the rise of a current conservative political movement in the United States. We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty, the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. What I'm looking at is the role photography plays in either supporting or resisting political corruption through the presentation of truth and fiction. 
And then I go on to say that it's a story told from the unique perspective of a Russian photojournalist, Leonid Bergoltsev, who covered news, uh, who covered world news events for the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War in 1991 and later emigrated to Spokane, Washington. And I'm adding the detail that Spokane has received an award as an all-American city. So I'm setting up that juxtaposition of a Soviet-era Cold War photojournalist immigrating to the United States in Spokane, Washington, which is an all-American city. I'm also explaining the background of the term sitting between two chairs that it's a common phrase among Russian immigrants that describes the awkwardness of feeling disconnected from their original identity and homeland and yet still not fully adopted into becoming an American. So this idea of, of sitting between two chairs is sitting between two cultures. The man must leave at home. Now the situation is not so simple. I cannot come back home because I have no home there. I am already not Russian and I am not American yet and will be never. I am sitting between two chairs and will stay in such a position until the finish. So here we have the log line, and what I've done is I've basically told the entire story in one uh, or two sentences here. Uh, here I've said, a Russian photojournalist who worked under Nikita Khrushchev at the height of the Cold War moves to America and discovers that the propaganda he left behind in the Soviet Union was actually more truthful than what is being published in contemporary American news media and warns us that America may be heading down the same path of political corruption, war, and economic collapse. Right there, one sentence that's setting up the drama of what this story is about. In addition to this, I'm adding an element to the story which is to express what it's like to be a first generation immigrant and how uh, he feels trapped sitting between the two cultures of Russia and America and how there's this huge gap between his experience and his granddaughter who's born in America who will become an American. And so I then further express the conflict which is that he can't find meaningful work uh, due to the economic meltdown after 9-11 and that he's lost his life savings and his home and he's been left without any way of returning to Russia where their life was much more prosperous. And then I'm introducing a little irony to the story uh, where I'm actually showing that he learned the craft of doing photography from Western photojournalists in Life magazine and how he met them in the 50s and that they inspired him to pursue an objective truth and that it's in effect his silent way of protesting against the dictatorship of the Soviet regime. And so from behind the Iron Curtain, he made images that were so well respected because of their documentary uh, qualities that he actually eventually was published in Life magazine in 1972. So what I'm doing there is I'm setting up that he's uniquely qualified and connected to the United States and Western news media uh, to come here and say that, you know what, things are not like they used to be in American news media and that the work he was doing from behind the Iron Curtain was actually more objective and truthful than the work that he's seeing here in America. The most interesting uh, Im impressions of America, I can see, in America everybody knows everything including photography, including foreign life, including everything. Because all of them, I think, think about photography not as a real art, not as a weapon for self-impressions, self-expressions, self-expressions, but only as an instrument to make money. Look at any American newspaper. What do you see? You see, you see 75 percent of absolutely the same pictures with different faces only. All of them are smiling, all of them are looking at the lens, 
All of them are waiting when the uncle push the knob. For whom such a picture is interesting? Only for these persons, for their relatives and for their managers maybe, not for readers. Uh, readers don't know all of these people and their faces, only faces without any reality, are not absolutely interesting for anybody. The picture, a good picture, must have some action, some part of a real life, maybe a little bit, but real life. Such a photography is died. Everybody has digital camera, everybody see the screen, everybody push the knob, everybody are photographers. But there is no photography. So with that, I've kind of painted the story of my film, uh, and then I'm defining the scope of the film that looks at the similarities between today's political conservatism in the United States and the Cold Era and the Cold War era propaganda. And then I'm looking at the dichotomy between socialism and capitalism through the relationship that he has with an American commercial photographer who makes his living selling advertising imagery versus he made his living doing uh, social documentary work. And then wanting to show the differences between observational photojournalism and a contemporary media event coverage and paparazzi and explain why we need visual literacy in the digital world. Further, I'm going to be defining what is the difference between candid photographs and television in terms of objectivity and narrative structures. And then finally, I'm going to describe how the financial meltdown of the economy has impacted first-generation immigrants who committed themselves to the ideals of the American dream are now stuck uh, in their new country. In looking at my target audience, I'm really looking at a uh, what would be a typical one-hour show segment on television. So I have a target length of about 44 minutes, which allows for the commercial ad breaks. Uh, and then I'm looking at distributing this through international film festivals as well as public broadcasting television and making DVDs available. And uh, at the time, this footage was shot on 1080i. Uh, high definition uh, video and edited in Final Cut Pro 6.0. Here we see the outline that starts with a beginning, middle, and end. And in the first act, we're kind of painting the picture of the Cold War and the American Dream. Uh, we're introducing Spokane as, as a major uh, place um, for that, that comparison and contrast with Russia. And we're also looking at the, introducing uh, the characters. So we're introducing his background, schooling, etc. In the middle, we're looking at kind of this conflict. And, and uh, I use a couple of quotes from an interview where he says, good for you. You know, you've got a flag in your hand and this idea of patriotism and, and the rise of nationalism uh, and, and how that impacted him after he arrived here when he came to visit his family. And so I'm just kind of painting that story and uh, describing the economic crisis that becomes a worldwide recession and how a new Cold War is emerging uh, between conservative and liberal ideologies and how it's very difficult for him to come to work, uh, come into work as a journalist. And, and then we're uh, looking at very contemporary issues uh, of how um, our current climate has made it very unfriendly for immigrants to come to this country. The final resolution is going to be found in the volunteer work that he is doing with the World Relief Organization that is responsible for welcoming and bringing immigrants to Spokane. And the resolution is going to be how he finds usefulness and purpose by making these photographs of other immigrants and how he is having influence on a new generation of younger photographers by mentoring, uh, and actually I'm going to change this, how he's having influence on new generation of younger photographers by mentoring a young Russian-American 
photographer named Victoria Alexandra. I have photographed since I was a little girl and I would make photos of family moments. Later when I was studying photography in college, I was encouraged to do a research project about Leonid. I first heard about Leonid Bergoltsev when I read about him in the newspaper. He was a very well-known photojournalist who was allowed to travel outside the Soviet Union and photograph world events. He is probably most well-known for documenting the career of Nikita Khrushchev. His photographs were published in Life magazine, and he knew many of the great photojournalists of that era, including Henri Cartier-Bresson. He did a book on China. That is where he met a Spokane photographer, Don Hamilton, who invited him to visit Spokane. Over the last two years, I have gotten to know Leonid quite well. I would come and have tea with him every week, and he would tell stories about his life and his work, and how different it is here in Spokane from where he lived in Moscow. I visit him often because he has a lot to share with me about photography and about the Russia my parents left behind. And then we're going to wrap it up with a kind of a universal uh, story where we have a, um, a new uh, international student comes to Spokane and has this amazing experience where Spokane citizens welcome him uh, with open arms and how he finds a connection here. Spokane to me is a very beautiful place and people over here are very helpful. And I was on the bus and I accidentally forgot my wallet at home. So I wasn't having any idea what should I do. Then the bus driver came to me and gave me the full day pass. And over that he also gave me $50 to spend for the whole day. And I can't forget that man for my whole life. Because coming to a new place, you are very confused at the moment and you don't know what to do. But he helped me like my father. So we're, we're talking about how to break through all of that uh, political propaganda through meaningful connections one-on-one. -on -one. When we get to the production elements, I'm describing what the look and feel is going to be for the film. I'm not s saying a shot list, but I am saying I'm going to use a combination of montage, interviews, and narrations to paint a picture of the American Dream and the Cold War. I'm describing the audio, which will consist of archival news footage, masked interview responses, and expository narrative to tie the chapters together. I'm describing who the narrative will be, uh, and that narrative is going to be this first-generation Russian-American photography student who has interviewed Mr. Bregoltsev, uh, and then I'm going to create an ironic tone through a constant juxtaposition of imagery and audio that are ideologically far apart. So I'm giving some example here. Archive news footage discussing unemployment rate would juxtapose with audio about the Soviet system that guaranteed jobs uh, and visuals portraying Spokane, Washington as an all-American city will be juxtaposed against a narration that explains the poverty rate within the community. Uh, and you'll see kind of this dichotomy existing here. Um, in addition to that, I'm describing what kind of interview footage I will be doing um, what kind of basic montages of shots I'm going to be including, what kind of archive materials I'm needing, uh, and just giving you an overall feel for the film. And then finally, I'm going to introduce the cast of characters and what their unique connection to the story is. So here I've got the main character, I've got the secondary character, Don Hamilton, the commercial photographer who invited Leonid Bregoltsev to America, and the, the Russian photography student who uh, gets to know him and through that gets to know her own heritage. The film will primarily focus on the life story of Leonid Bregoltsev with secondary interviews of Don Hamilton, uh, providing a measure of contrast by which to illustrate the differences between Soviet and American political and economic systems. We're going to include Victoria, we'll provide the narrative overview, uh, and actually, we need to introduce um, some additional characters. So I'm going to add some expert voices. So I'm going to add a media uh, professor, James McPherson. 
a professor of media studies at Whitworth University who will talk about uh, the changing media landscape in America and its impact on politics. And then we'll also talk to uh, Karen Dorn Steele, a retired investigative journalist who has exposed political corruption in America, in American politics. You at least get a sense we have some more expert interviews, um, almost like having expert witnesses to validate uh, the hypothesis in the beginning, which is that the kind of imagery in our news and, and the kind of news reporting that we're getting is having a, a is having an effect on the political climate in the United States. And then we'll add the uh, student. Who's an international student from India studying in Spokane and who has made positive connections. So to wrap things up, the last thing I want to say about a film treatment is it's the starting point for your project. It may, may or may not be the ending point. What I mean by that is it is a way to organize your thoughts, a way to see if you've got a good story. It's a way to organize some ideas about your film production. But in the end, when you go out and produce your film, and when you go through the editing process, you may end up with something that's slightly different than the treatment, and that's completely okay. It's part of the brainstorming process that goes into your projects. The film treatment is a way to organize your thoughts, organize your story, and a way to start your film production. It may change in the process of doing the filming. You might go down another path. You might have to come back and revise it. In the case of my project, I actually produced a complete film. I had it shown at a film festival, but as I go back and revisit the treatment, I actually see a better story, and so I'm gonna go back and rework that film uh, and make it better. So uh, it's a continuous looping uh, cycle where you start with a film treatment, you work on the production, you make adjustments, you finish it, and then if you have time and you want to go back and revise that treatment and revise your project, great. If not, like they say in the film industry, a movie is never done. It's just finally given up on. And so with that, I leave you to get working on your first film treatment for your final project in this class.